Father, we know that the early church, some call it the primitive church, but oh, that we could go back and be primitive. They continued in the apostles' doctrine and teaching and in fellowship and in prayer, breaking of bread, sharing their goods, and great awe fell upon them. And you added daily to their number those that were being saved because they were a great commissioned church. Lord, tonight that's what we want to be. I realize there may be those who will hear the teaching that have not yet made a decision to follow you, to surrender their life. I ask that you will speak to them. And I also know that there are believers here to say, well, I've heard this message before. I know this material. I believe it. But for all of us, let it be true that we add to the word our faith and that it creates salvation in our hearts for those maybe for the first time for others compelling us to take this teaching and understand that you are equipping us because we are your disciples and the things that we hear from you among many witnesses we're going to share with others so that they can learn and believe and then teach others themselves. Holy Spirit, take the words, the teachings of Jesus and show them to us. His words are spirit. His words are life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I spent much of the 80s and almost all of the 90s here in Salt Lake City, as a church planting pastor, and probably my life's message was and is the evidence of the resurrection, the great message communicated by the apostles and promulgated through the ages to this day, changing lives everywhere it's declared. I believe you realize that Christianity claims to be based on historical fact testified to by many witnesses. Christians claim that God has actually intervened in human affairs, and I believe that to be true. And yet some Christians are uncomfortable with a study of Christian evidences because they feel such a study shows a lack of faith. But I want to remind you tonight that God doesn't call us to a blind faith. He calls us to an intelligent faith. In fact, Peter tells the believers that he addresses in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 15, that we are to be ready to share an answer or share a defense to those that ask us questions about our hope. Jesus was careful to provide evidence necessary to give a factual foundation for our faith. After his resurrection, think it, uh, it, it through with me, he ate with the apostles. He had them touch him, and he gave them other proofs that he was physically alive. Jesus often referred people to evidence that proved he was the Son of God. After John the Baptist was put into prison, he became disenchanted and concerned as to whether or not Jesus was the Messiah, so he sent some of his followers to inquire. Listen to Jesus' answer as he refers them to the evidence in Matthew 11, verses 4 and 5. He says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Didn't end there. After his resurrection, the Lord joined two disciples on the road to Emmaus, who were in deep despair because Jesus, whom they hoped was their Messiah, had been put to death. 
after chiding them, Jesus opened up the scriptures and he gave them evidence of his Messiahship by showing them numerous prophecies from the Old Testament made hundreds of years prior that all had been fulfilled in his life and his death. In Luke 24, 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And don't you know, that took some time. Luke begins his gospel this way. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Then he goes on to state how he himself has prepared a written account so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And tonight, that's what I want to do is I want to drive home certainty about everything you've heard and been taught and will continue to hear because these things are attested to by eyewitnesses. John even begins his first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have touched. Think of this description concerning the word of life. The life appeared and we have seen it and we testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, speaking of Jesus, and appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father God and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so the evidence of the resurrection is a powerful proclamation that began with Jesus and the apostles and continues to be presented to this day. And so to do this, let's begin in John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Some said, well, they, the disciples probably, they probably stole the body because they obviously w wanted to continue in their faith and trust of Jesus. But the reality is they feared for their lives. They were cowards. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, cried the psalmist. Jesus said, as he stood among them, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, now I'm going to send you. And as he said this, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Don't be confused. This is their conversion experience. This is when they were born again. Because Jesus hadn't yet been resurrected during his ministry, and now that he is, he tells them, I told you I'm going to send the Spirit. He's with you, but he's going to be in you. And he breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. And now by one spirit, they're all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. And then later, before he ascends into heaven, he says, now go wait in Jerusalem. Ten days later, the day of Pentecost, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Second baptism. Powerful. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you will withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, also called the twin or Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, they said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. They're overjoyed. But Thomas says to them, I, unless I see 
in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He says, unless I see, unless I touch, unless I experience empirically via my senses, I will not believe. Let me just say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the pivotal event of human history. Those before it were anticipating the coming of the Messiah, not completely understanding what that would look like. Those after his resurrection marvel at what he has accomplished. In fact, the writer of Hebrews talks about how great the salvation is that we can share, in, and he says it's a thing that the angels desire to peer into, to stoop down and have a look at this great salvation which has been purchased for you and for me. Have you ever thought about what happened from the stable to the tomb? I think about it often, and I think about it at this time as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, I want you to consider very quickly his amazing life. And I'll just give you 12 events. There are many more. His virgin birth. Gabriel appearing to Mary and to Joseph. Mary being found with child by the Holy Spirit, never having known her husband Joseph intimately. The baptism by John. Think of it, Jesus goes down to the water, John says, oh, no, 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 you should baptize me. Jesus says, let it be this way for now. And as John baptizes Jesus, heaven is opened, and people are standing around watching and listening, and they see a dove, and they recognize the Holy Spirit's presence is falling on Jesus as his ministry begins, and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Wow. And then the first miracle, turning water into wine at Cana of Galilee. And then the profound Sermon on the Mount. How about the feeding of 5,000 men? Doesn't mention the women and the children that were present. So we're talking about more than 10,000 people fed from those baskets with a few loaves and fishes or the transfiguration on Mount Tabor or Mount Hebron, depending on which uh, site you choose, where as Jesus goes with Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, suddenly in his presence appear Moses and Elijah. Think about that. The two great figures from the old covenant, Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, the great prophet of God. Peter's so excited, he's beside himself. He says, I'm going to put together some, some makeshift tents so we can stay up here a long time. Who wants to go back and be with the crowds and we can hang out with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? You know what happened? God speaks again, the Father. He speaks, he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Moses is great. Elijah is good. Listen to Jesus. He's different. He really is. And then there's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. How about the triumphal entry? This is just a week prior to Passover. And Jesus, for the first time, allows people to call him king. Up till then, never allowed it. Direct fulfillment of Gabriel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. The 70 weeks prophecy, and he says that the Messiah will, will come. And, and be declared the king, and then he'll ultimately be cut off. How about the Last Supper, the Passover Jesus shares with his disciples when he washes their feet, and he establishes the Christian communion, or his arrest in Gethsemane. Think of these events, momentous, aren't they? His disciples are asleep while he's arrested, and you remember the soldiers say, are you he? And he says, I am. What happened when he said, I am? And by the way, who else said, I am? Yeah, several times, and Jesus several times too. And when he said, I am, they all fell back 
to the ground. A little demonstration of power there, I would call that. We talk about power encounters. Oh, my goodness. And then his crucifixion by Roman soldiers. And finally, his burial in a borrowed tomb. But the most astounding event in the life of Jesus Christ is his resurrection from the grave. It's the most powerful, unbelievable, singularly the most important event in human history. Now, we share a, an evidence-based faith. I like to call it evidentiary Christianity. It's not just faith in something. It's evidence-based faith. Acts 1.3 says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Wouldn't you have liked to have heard that teaching? So thorough is the evidence regarding Jesus Christ his crucifixion, his burial, so thorough that historic scholars agree. Think about this. Maybe you haven't heard this. Today, secular historians as well as Christian or believing historians all agree on some minimal facts. They've kind of boiled it down. In fact, this is championed by the historian Gary Habermath and, and uh, Michael Lycona, both PhDs, brilliant scholars, Six minimal facts of the resurrection. I'll give them to you quickly. But the scholastic community agrees on these. There are so many people say there's no evidence for Jesus. There's no evidence for the resurrection. I want you to know the historical community agrees today. They don't debate it anymore. Number one, there's six of these. Jesus died by crucifixion. A fact embraced. Believer and non-believer. Historical scholars are actually acknowledging his life when they admit he died by crucifixion. Number two, his disciples had experiences that they believe were appearances of the risen Jesus. Think about that. Even doubters agree that the disciples thought they saw Jesus. Number three, because they believed he rose from the dead, it became the event that turned the world upside down religiously. Because they believed it, it became the event. Let me just say this. Christianity is a resurrection religion. There is no other. It's the only one. It's the only one. To the extent they were willing to give their lives to declare the message. Number four. Scholars agree, it was proclaimed very early. So there's a lot of criticism of the Gospels. Oh, they weren't written. They weren't circulated until the late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even, even 110 AD. But what's interesting is the historical community agrees that you can track resurrection preaching to immediately after the cross. It started right away the preaching. And it was already codified in creeds at Saul's conversion, which was two or three years after Jesus was crucified and raised. Already codified in creeds to the extent that Paul, in his writings, relates some of these creedal statements. Now, we're used to like the creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Apostles' Creed. And these are these great statements of faith that talk about every point of our belief system. But there were creeds circulated in the first century after Jesus rose that were very simple, and they basically contained, contained three elements. Deity, death, and resurrection. That's powerful. The message was, he is Lord, he died, he rose. He's alive. Now I'm going to give you three of them really quickly. Romans 1, 3, and 4. Paul's writing. Concerning his son, verse 3, 
who was descended from David according to the flesh, and he was declared the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see it there? Deity, death, and resurrection contained in that passage. Another, Romans 4, 24. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. So the acknowledgement of the Father, declaration that Jesus is Lord, deity, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Do you see it there? There's deity, there's death, and there's resurrection. And then one passage we're very familiar with, and we use it regularly, Romans 10.9. Declared by scholars to be a baptismal formula, a baptismal creedal statement of the first century, repeated by Paul. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, deity, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, death, you will be saved, because God raised him, resurrection. That's awesome. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. So let's go to the fifth minimal fact. James, the brother of Jesus. I like this one. James, the brother of Jesus, had a post-resurrection conversion experience. Prior to that experience, he never followed Jesus. He rejected Jesus. He rejected his preaching. He rejected his miracles. Now, there are religious institutions today that tell us, oh, well, James really wasn't the brother of Jesus. He was a cousin. He was a distant relative. Now, why does Paul cite that James had an appearance from Jesus? Why is that important? Because James was not a cousin. He was one of Jesus' four brothers. He probably had two sisters. Mary had children after Jesus was born. And it's critical because James literally grew up with Jesus. They were children together, teenagers, young men. And he witnessed his ministry, as, as did his brothers and sisters and mother. But the brothers and sisters rejected him. And when Jesus rose from the dead after he appeared to the apostles, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appeared to James. It wasn't to James, the brother of John, or to the other James, the apostle. It was to another James. And if you look at the order recorded in Acts 15, or 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see what I'm, I'm getting at. Jesus appeared to him. And as a result, James converted. James is listed in the believers that are in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. He's there praying. James is there when the Holy Spirit falls. James is baptized in the Holy Spirit and empowered to witness. And James becomes very prominent in the New Testament church. He grows up with Jesus. He's converted after the resurrection. And he immediately began associating with the apostles. And he became the presiding elder of the Jerusalem church. He wrote letters to believers. In fact, Scholars have compared James' speech at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 because of its similarities of language and phrasing to the book of James, which is penned by James, the brother of Jesus. And thus the early church ascribes to James that, that book, to the brother of Jesus. Converted. That's a testimony believed by secular historians. They know about James. He not only led the Jerusalem church, he was martyred in Jerusalem, not far from the temple. They used to call him old camel knees because he spent so much time in the temple on his knees praying that he had calluses, praying for the Jews who wouldn't come to Christ. He's also called James the Elder. Unbelievable. And then last of all, number six, historians, about 99% agree, Paul who didn't invent Christianity. Can I point that out to you? He didn't invent Christianity, as some will claim. Paul had a life-altering experience on the road to Damascus, Syria. And he tells us later in his writing that he spent the rest of his life trying to apprehend what he had been apprehended for. 
Because <laughs> Jesus did indeed apprehend Paul. What's amazing to me is in spite of this agreement on these six minimal facts, many still fail to follow him. You see, people acknowledge these truths, but they do not believe. Now, this is really important. For our purposes today, I want to quickly develop five evidences that lead to faith in Jesus Christ, because that's the end of the argument. It's not that you can ascribe to, you can embrace some facts, historic facts, proven facts. If you leave here today and say, well, I believe all those things that Jim shared, that does nothing for me unless you mix it with faith and embrace him as Lord. That's the point. Or unless you take it today, mix it with faith and say, Lord Jesus, use me to promote this message to the ends of the earth until you come, because I want to be a part of the Great Commission Church. The point of our discussion is we're looking toward a belief that results in saving faith. Why? Because even the demons believe, don't they? James Chapter 2, verse 19, the brother of Jesus says, Even the demons believe in Jesus Christ. And what is their response? They tremble. They shudder. They've seen him. Now just quickly look at this, this slide regarding evaluating truth, because I think this is important as we move on. If you think some of these facts are impossible, you would be called an atheist. If you are doubtful regarding them, you would probably be termed an agnostic. Doubtful these things took place. Many people today would say, well, it's plausible, or they would say, it's probable. And I would say that's the camp of believers. There are many people that believe. So see the progression? It's impossible. It couldn't happen. Doubtful? I don't think so. Plausible? Maybe. Probable, yeah, probably did. But all of those aren't going to get you across the line. Because the Bible tells us that it's grace coupled with faith that produces a believer. It's not enough just to believe the historical facts. For it to become a reality for you or for me, for it to be proven, we need to add our faith. And of course, that faith is a gift from God. So quickly, let me tell you why I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you today, and I encourage you to use this same very simple outline, why I believe in Jesus and in the resurrection. Number one, I believe because of the evidence of Scripture. This is so important. The evidence of Scripture. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, receiving the Word of God. There's a lot of great books you can read about the resurrection and about Jesus' ministry. But let me encourage you that there's a book you should be spending a lot of time in. It's called the Bible. Believers today do not spend enough time in the Bible. Get in God's Word. Why? Because these words are spirit. These words are life. I'm writing a book. I hope it'll be a good book. Maybe some of you will read my book. But let me encourage you. This is the book you want to read. This is the book you need. It's number one bestseller. Yeah. 66 books written over several centuries. 40 authors with a uniting theme of God's salvation available to all. John 20, 31 says, These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by, by believing you may have life in his name. But Jesus says this. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now listen to this. John 6, 44 says, You can't come to him. You can't become a believer unless you're drawn by the Father. So what this is telling me is it's not enough for me to mentally assent to some facts. And there are a lot of people today that, that, that are going forward and they're saying, yeah, I, I, I believe that, I accept that, I guess I'm a believer now. The Bible says that God's got to draw you. There's got to be a conviction. There's got to be a presence of the Holy Spirit. There needs to be repentance and then obedience. We need to see ourselves like God sees us, not the way we think of ourselves. Like, I'm just going to add Jesus to my life. I'm going to put him on my calendar. It's a totally different story when you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, counting the costs. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace have you been saved through faith. It's by grace. What is grace? 
Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We've been saved by grace through faith. Where did the faith come from? It says it's not of yourselves. It's God's gift. The faith that we have comes from God. Paul says that God has given everyone a measure of faith. Some people just never activate it, but it's in every human being. The ability, the desire to believe, once it's triggered, once we surrender. He says, it's not a result of your work so that no one will boast, for we are his workmanship. You see, you can't work for this. You cannot perform. We don't deserve it. We think sometimes we deserve it. We're good enough. We did it. We didn't. He did it. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. It's not what I have done. Paul says, not by works of righteousness that I did, but according to his mercy, he saved me. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel is veiled, you've heard this before, if, if our gospel is hidden, it's hid to those who are perishing because the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe so they cannot see the light of the gospel. That's why we have to pray that God will open their eyes, raise the blinders, widen the curtain because the God of this age doesn't want people to believe doesn't want people to be saved. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says God will send strong delusions so that we'll, people will believe a lie, so they will be condemned who haven't believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Now, I know that's speaking of when the Antichrist is revealed. I realize it's future, but it also gives us insight. God doesn't want us to spend our lives in wickedness and then just think at the last moment, we're going to say, okay, I'm going to turn on my faith. And I'm going to believe the message I heard all my life, which I already mentally ascended to, and now I'm saved. doesn't work that way. God's working in us. In fact, the influence of the Holy Spirit in an unsaved person's life will lead the person to the realization that we're guilty, that God is just, and that as sinners, we deserve judgment. And once a sinner has been awakened to, the, to our soul's great need, the Holy Spirit will point us to Christ. So we need these facts, but we need the work of God in our lives. And that's what Jesus says in John 16, verse 8. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to my Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of the world now stands condemned. The sin... The sin that God is judging is the sin of rejecting Christ. The righteousness he speaks of is that Jesus, who came from heaven, lived a sinless life, returns to heaven, and nobody can hold anything against him, including the powers of darkness. You can't touch Jesus. He's righteous. And judgment is coming, and it's coming for the devil and his angels. And the only reason that any human being will be judged is because they rebel and would rather throw in their lot with the enemy than with the Savior of their souls. Because he died for all of us. And thus I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God to salvation. Not my mental ascent, not my intellect, this is not tonight about you being able to grapple with these things. And, well, I can, I, can, I can reason with Jim and with the apostles and with the word, and I guess I figured it out, and yeah, I believe. Now I'm saved. No. The gospel, the good news, is God's power to save people. Wow. To salvation. Number two is the evidence of messianic prophecy. I'll go through this really fast. There are 332 distinct detailed predictions regarding the coming Messiah, according to my count, in my teaching since the early 80s. But Peter Stoner, who was born in 1888, was a Christian writer and the chairman of the departments of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena City College, and also the chairman of the science division at Westmont College back in the 50s. And he came up with a calculation. He calculated not based on 100, not based on 200, not based on 300 or more, but he calculated based on eight prophecies, eight prophecies, the probability that they could be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. He's a mathematician. Here's the eight prophecies. Number one, 
the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. Number two, a messenger will prepare the way for the Messiah, Malachi 3.1. Number three, the Messiah will enter Jerusalem as a king riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. The question is, one man in how many who has entered Jerusalem as a ruler will ride on a donkey? Number four, the Messiah will be betrayed by a friend and he'll also suffer wounds in his hands, Zechariah 13.6. These are Old Testament prophecies. Number five, the Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Number six, the betrayal money will be used to purchase a potter's field, Zechariah 11.13. Think about it. One man and how many, after receiving a bribe for the betrayal of a friend, Judas, to betray Jesus, has tried to return the money to those that gave it, has that refused, and then they use the money to buy a potter's field. Number seven, the Messiah will remain silent while he's afflicted, Isaiah 53, seven. One man in how many, when he is oppressed and afflicted, though innocent, will make no defense of himself. And number eight, the Messiah will die by having his hands and feet pierced. Psalm 22, 16, uttered by David, one man and how many since the time of King David has been crucified? When you multiply all these probabilities together, it produces an astounding number, just for eight. And I said there's 332, according to my count. The estimated number of people who have lived since the time of these prophecies is 88 billion. The resulting probability of all eight prophecies being fulfilled accidentally in the life of one person is one in 10 to the 28th power, or one followed by 28 zeros. It's mathematically impossible, and that's for eight. That's for eight. Number three, the evidence of history. Quickly, history, the historicity of Jesus. Jesus' life and ministry, his crucifixion, is the most authenticated event in ancient history, according to theologian Charles Dodge. Charles Spurgeon, who was called the Prince of Preachers, said the resurrection is a better attested fact than any recorded event in history. So I'll just summarize it for you. In the first, second, third centuries, Tacitus, Thallus, Phlegon, Josephus, the Jewish Talmud, even Encyclopedia Britannica in recent years, all attest to, they witness to these facts. They wrote of Christ's life, his death, they wrote of the darkness over the earth at his crucifixion, they wrote of John the Baptist, James the brother, uh, the Lord's brother, they wrote about Saul of Tarsus, Paul the apostle, they wrote about Pilate, Caiaphas, Gamaliel, etc. And so we ask the question that Pilate asks. In view of these facts, what must I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, anointed Messiah? Number four is the evidence of an empty tomb. It drives me to the question, who rolled away the stone? Because crucifixion equals death and sets the stage for resurrection. Let me put it another way. Resurrection requires death. Jesus really had to be dead to be raised. If he didn't die, then resurrection... It's not, it's not a reality. And death is assured by the Roman crucifixion. History confirms that the tomb was empty. That's a record of history. The evidence that he lived and died is a reality. And that his body wasn't burned. Because typically when you were taken up to Golgotha and you were killed as a criminal, they took your body down and they took you down into the valley of Gehenna below the wall outside of the city of Jerusalem and they burned you. Jesus wasn't burned because a man from the council by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, a historic figure, showed up and said, could I have the body? What do you want with it? I have a tomb, my own tomb, and I'd like to lay him there. He was buried in Joseph's tomb. Several facts regarding, regarding crucifixion. Scourging slash crucifixion results in death. How do I know? Well, you can read the accounts, and I believe them to be true. But interestingly, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, did a very detailed historical analysis of all the evidence regarding the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I have the report right here. 
It's many pages long. It goes through every detail of his death. It deals with his anatomy. It deals with everything they did to him and, and his response. I would love to read to you their thesis as they began. I don't have time, but let me just read to you their conclusion. They say at the end of the article, the article is written by doctors, surgeons at the most respected clinic in America. The important feature may be not how he died, but rather whether he died. Clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear thrust between his right ribs probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and heart and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. You think the farther away you get from the cross and the first century, the more we'll be able to, dis to disprove the facts. The reality is the farther we get away, the stronger is the evidence. Not only is he alive, I want to remind you he's coming back. And if you're not living right with him tonight, and if I'm not in right relationship with him now, it's time to get right with God. Not only so that we see him and spend eternity with him, but so that we can serve him in the meantime. Let's get busy and occupy till he comes. Amen. Right? Wow. And then last, last of all, the evidence of the witnesses. I'm almost done. The evidence of the witnesses. Abundant historical references leave Little reasonable doubt that Jesus lived and died. We already know that. But the more interesting question to me is whether Jesus died and then lived. That's what we really want to know. We know he lived, but did he die and then live? Peter says in 116, second letter, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. That's been the, the, the attack of some. These are just fairy tales, stories, legends passed down. No, he says these weren't de cleverly devised fables. He's sharing this in the first century. He says, we were eyewitnesses. And he said that before he was martyred. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the most important thing I can tell you. He says, as he starts his overview of the witnesses, he says, this is of first importance. This is the most important thing. And here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Old Testament Scriptures. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, even though some are dead. And then he appeared to his brother, James, and then to all the apostles again, and last of all, Paul says, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Wow. Scholars agree that 1 Corinthians was written about 55 AD. 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 years before the Gospels were circulated. Paul writes this and circulates it to the church at Corinth. It's, in, it's within 20 to 25 years of the resurrection by Paul, who knew the witnesses. He spent time on two occasions in Jerusalem with the apostles. He saw Jesus himself on the Damascus Road, and Jesus appeared to him on other occasions and taught him the gospel. Read it in your Bibles. It's true. So when Paul is going to Rome and he's Questioned by Herod Agrippa and Festus, Paul says this in Acts 26, 18. Jesus told me, I am sending you to open their eyes, turn them from the darkness to the light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Can you believe Jesus said that to Paul? That is power. And he'll use you and I to do the very same thing. There's 15 post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. I can give you a list. I have it documented. It's amazing. 
and 12 of the 13 eyewitnesses are martyred for their testimony. 12 of 13, including Paul, the only one that wasn't martyred was John. They boiled him in oil. They were trying to martyr him. Didn't work, didn't take. So they banished him to Patmos where he has and writes the revelation and then he dies as an old man. The point is, our response to the gospel, the good news, determines our salvation or our standing. So let's finish it up. How do we respond to this evidence? Well, John 20, 26. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and this time Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, they're still afraid. They're still hiding out. They're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's not until day of Pentecost, some days later. And Jesus appears to them and he says, peace be with you. And he marches right over to Thomas. Jesus goes straight to Thomas. And he says, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus, in somewhat of a rebuke, says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I think that's all of us. In fact, Peter says, 1 Peter 1, 7, you love him though you have never seen him. Think about it. That's talking to us. It was talking to some then too, but it's talking to us. Though you do not see him now. You say, I feel like I see Jesus. Yeah, but he's talking about seeing him through this eye gate like he saw him and feeling him through the touch as he did. He says, you don't see him now, but you trust him and you rejoice with an ex- express glorious joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Paul says to Herod Agrippa, why should you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Your belief system is too small if you don't believe in God. Time for atheism and agnosticism to go and believe in the one who made us. In fact, Festus says to Paul, Paul, you've learned so much. All this learning has made you a madman. And Paul responds, Acts 26, 25, what I am saying is true and reasonable. This isn't blind faith. This is intelligent. And Paul says, this was not done in a corner. So before we pray, Christianity boasts an empty tomb and a risen Lord. The eyewitness accounts confirm a consistent testimony. The testimony is confirmed by the individual distinct martyrdoms of the apostles. And the subsequent changed lives throughout history evidence the resurrection to this day. And finally, the resurrection confirms Jesus Christ's claims to deity. I am that I am. So where do you stand tonight? Are you like Thomas? You say, unless I... I see, I'll never believe. Or are you like Thomas, my Lord and my God? I'm going to ask Pastor Jason to come back. I know we've gone over tonight, and I'm going to ask him to come back and lead us in a prayer. But just acknowledge with me tonight that it's important to embrace the information, to take the facts. Faith comes by hearing the word, but it's got to be mixed with faith. So Holy Spirit, come. Come and turn faith on in our lives so that we might believe and be saved.